MERP capstones are intended to showcase the knowledge, skills, and values that students have developed over the course of their graduate work. We have a thesis option, but most of our students choose to complete a client-based project for their capstone, which we call the professional plan. Hello, my name is Megan Goff. I'm an associate professor of urban planning in the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at Virginia Commonwealth University. Naraj Verma and I work with students in our Master of Urban and Regional Planning program as they develop their capstone projects. Thank you, Megan. I'm Naraj Verma. And the capstone experience is a year long endeavor for our students. They build a relationship with a client for their project. And our clients come from all sectors and all scales of planning. Students will frequently secure clients from the public sector. These might be planning or development agencies or even parks and recreation agencies or regional planning organizations. At other times, the clients are nonprofits uh, organizations that are advocating for housing and community development. And sometimes the clients come from the private sector. So we have design firms and transportation consultants as clients. Students build a proposal to respond to requests outlined by the clients. And then they spend a semester conducting research, engaging the community and analyzing results to develop recommendations that come in the form of a plan. And what's exciting is that many times these plans and the recommendations within them are implemented by the clients to further goals of their organizations. What you'll see here in the student presentations is a translation of their year long work in these plans into a three minute summary. So let's go check them out. Here are the presentations. Located on a formal gravel mining site in west central Minnesota in Swift County, the Appleton area OHV Park is an important local and regional asset that brings people to the community from as far away as Texas and Nebraska. According to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, 5% of Minnesotans own about 300,000 off-highway vehicles or OHVs, but with restrictions on OHV use on state land and limited access to private lands, there is an evident need for dedicated spaces for OHV use to contain the corresponding negative environmental impacts. With the vast majority of po public OHV resources located in the northeastern half of the state, the few OHV parks in the southwestern half of the state serve an important role in meeting the regional need. The park covers about 330 acres with 26 miles of trails. There are three shelters, west, north, and east, and portable toilets. The park is unique in that it has trails for every class of OHV identified by the DNR, four wheelers, dirt bikes, and four by four trucks. There is no fee to enter the park, but OHV users in the park must register their vehicles with the state of Minnesota. Public outreach for the master plan was done in the summer of 2020 and included distribution of a poster with a survey link. The 271 overwhelmingly positive responses came from a good balance of locals and others scattered across the state, as well as Nebraska and North and South Dakota. Why people visit the park and what they would like to see added to the park were the two most useful feedback categories. It was clear that the park is primarily an OHV park and the steering committee wanted to keep that as the character of the park going forward. Based on the feedback in the user survey, the committee came up with four main recommendations. Adding convenience amenities to the park, such as restrooms, vehicle wash stations, and improved parking lots makes staying all day at the park a more convenient experience for entire families. Improving connections to the park includes the development of clear park wayfinding, improving the OHV connection to the city of Appleton, and utilizing existing camping facilities. Expanding the park was a major finding of the survey and local leaders have been asked to expand the park for many years. To meet this demand, four parcels have been identified for park expansion. Development of park maintenance plan and an increasing staffing will ensure that the park is maintained in a manner that encourages people to return. <clears throat> Implementation of the recommendations will take place over the course of the next 10 years with purchase of an adjacent property being the first step in expanding the park. Adding bathrooms, wash stations, 
and day use beach area will come within two years and subsequent phases of development will follow as county funds become available. While adding the proposed park amenities will rely heavily on grant funds, some matching funds are required. Swift County residents expect their leadership to spend tax money conservatively. Park development will ultimately depend upon political will. Hello, and welcome to the three minute thesis presentation on the one VCU master plan iconic green for the Monroe Park campus. I'm Nicholas Jankaitis, and I will be taking you through the results and recommendations found during this process. The first takeaway is that the term iconic was found to be too much for the expected user, transitioning the name to the MPC Green. One of the main reasons that the name was transitioned is the essential tension that exists in the design and planning fields. In this case, there are historic examples where these tensions between the process and outcome play out. None are more famous than the design of the Vietnam War Memorial by Maya Lin. Her project has a parallel image problem that the MPC Green will have as well. The just city would have us assume that the process is the most critical element for the MPC Green and the city beautiful movement would counter the outcome as the essential requirement. VCU is an urban campus with a history tying it to the Richmond and multiple higher education foundations. The site is currently built on and allows for a sustainable and equity-based design approach to be taken for the MPC Green. The MPC Green problem statement shapes an argument between the process argument brought forward by the Just City movement and the outcome argument put forward by the City Beautiful movement. Marrying the two into harmony is a theoretical framework used for the MPC Green in the form of the Just Beautiful City. Case study analysis shows that local comparable iconic spaces from universities can provide valid examples of good design principles. One stood out, a drill field at Virginia Tech. The survey tidbit about how off-putting the term iconic green is really encapsulated the idea that for a design process to be truly equitable, there has to be a fundamental understanding of the ultimate user's desires. Focusing on those end users led to the creation of the vision statement and goals for the MPC Green. Through the provision of urban outdoor space, the MPC Green will enhance the beauty and nurture the health and well-being of the VCU and Richmond communities. The goals go on to further define just how the MPC Green can and should accomplish the vision. Supporting those goals are further objectives and actions to quantify the tension of the just beautiful city into reasonable end states. The two biggest pieces of the recommendations are to present an international design contest for the MPC Green, which honors the outcome-based city beautiful argument, and the use of a city, just city equitable community-based design process. Here is where Maya Lin said that she struggled when she designed the simple wound into the ground on the National Mall. She couldn't remedy the political process that surrounded public space through design. However, by teaming the contest with the friends of the MPC Green and local experts, the merging of the two will speak to an and embrace the essential tension between the process and the outcome. Thank you for your time and attention and feel free to reach out to me at the information provided on the screen. In the year 2050, our built environment will look very different in order to adapt to the threat of climate change that is present today. Virginia, along with a growing number of other states and countries around the world, has promised to have net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. In Virginia, work has already begun to reach this goal. In the year 2020 alone, Virginia added over 850 megawatts in installed utility scale solar capacity, or what is more commonly referred to as a solar farm. This recent growth in 2020 more than doubled the previous total solar capacity in the state. With solar energy being the most abundant source of energy on Earth, this development will likely continue into the future. Although large, utility-scale solar has proven to be an effective and affordable strategy of reaching zero carbon emissions, its implementation does have an important land use component. As a result, the recent growth of the solar industry has led to the convergence of energy planning and land use planning efforts at local and regional scales unlike ever before. Accordingly, this research examines the current land use patterns and trends of the development of utility scale solar facilities to inform policy strategies, avoid future land use conflicts, and facilitate the sustainable development of solar infrastructure. With the use of GIS, I identify the location and total area of all utility scale solar facilities in Virginia with a capacity of at least five megawatts. After locating each facility, 
I analyzed the previous land use of solar facilities, so I studied the demographics of the surrounding area and compiled trends on the location of existing solar facilities in Virginia. In total, as of January 2021, there were 38 utility scale solar facilities operating in Virginia, primarily in rural and lightly populated areas in the southern and eastern portions of the state. These facilities total about 1,580 megawatts of capacity and covered approximately 13,800 acres, with forested lands and croplands being the most heavily impacted lands by new solar facilities. Ultimately, these findings substantiate the need to continue to track and study the implementation of solar and other renewable energy sources in Virginia. Solar energy is a critical component of our Virginia economy, free of greenhouse gas emissions. As a result, it is important that planners take the proper steps now to ensure that solar energy infrastructure is properly integrated into future land use policies and priorities. This includes identifying previously disturbed lands that can accommodate solar, co-locating solar with more active uses, including agriculture, and maximizing the opportunity that solar development can provide to local communities. My name is Rebecca Aquin. I'm a degree candidate for the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning program at Virginia Commonwealth University. I'll be giving a brief presentation on the Green Infrastructure Plan for Residential Property in Richmond, Virginia. The purpose of this plan is to identify green infrastructure or GI opportunities on privately owned residential property throughout the city of Richmond. This plan intends to provide recommendations that will increase public awareness and participation in residential GI implementation. The clients of this plan are the City of Richmond Department of Public Utilities or DPU and RVA H2O. The city of Richmond has the largest combined sewer system in the state of Virginia. In 2018 alone, more than 3 billion gallons of wastewater flooded into the James River from the city of Richmond's combined sewer system. A combined sewer system collects wastewater and stormwater and conveys it in a single pipe to a wastewater treatment plant. When there are extreme rain or snow melt events, the system's capacity to collect and convey water is exceeded, leading to something called combined sewer overflows. Combined sewer overflows pose a risk to environmental and human health. Green infrastructure is an increasingly utilized tool to help manage stormwater. Um, green infrastructure includes rain barrels, permeable pavement, green roofs, um, rain gardens. <laughs> This infrastructure mimics natural processes by soaking up rain and wastewater before it can enter the sewer system. So Richmond's residential properties, um, in total, the single family, multifamily, and duplexes account for approximately 21 square miles or 33% of Richmond's total land area which highlights the significant stake that homeowners and residential property owners hold in stormwater management and the potential they have to implement GI practices citywide. The research questions of this plan are what are the barriers to residential property owners implementing GI? What best management practices geared towards community participation have other cities implemented? What strategies could be implemented in Richmond to gain buy-in of stormwater management? The research methods were case studies of comparable CSS cities, a stakeholder survey, and then an ArcGIS analysis of residential property and um, zones of opportunity in the city of Richmond. The research findings were that financial and non-financial incentives in addition to public education and outreach are key to increasing green infrastructure implementation in residential properties. And lastly, equity should be incorporated into the green infrastructure planning framework to ensure all Richmond residents have fair access to information and opportunities to participate in green stormwater management. Thank you. When was the last time that you ordered a physical book off of Amazon? Now while you're thinking about that, let's talk a little bit about trails. 
So the Virginia Capital Trail runs over 50 miles from the colonial capital of Virginia, the Jamestown, Williamsburg area, to its present capital in Richmond. Now the Capital Trail, uh, which was established in 2015, is neither the, the longest nor the oldest trail in the area, but is the most popular. So why is that? What makes the Capital Trail unique? Well, the big thing the Capital Trail does exceptionally well is that it separates the user from the road. So the Capital Trail is a paved trail, which for the most part is separate from the road, meaning that riders or rollers, or runners, or just someone pushing a stroller can comfortably use the trail without fear of being around cars, without having to worry about navigation. Also, the Capital Trail runs from two urban environments, Williamsburg and, and Richmond, to more rural areas. What this means, combined with the safety features of the trail, is that you can take your family out for a, a bike ride or a walk, and you can go from a urban setting to a more rural setting, which allows you to enjoy all the benefits of being out in nature, be they physical, mental, or emotional, and then go back home at the end of the day. Now, if this sounds fantastic to you, you are not alone in that thought process. So we've seen a large number of trails being planned and begun construction begun in the region, whether it's the Fall Line Trail running from Petersburg up to Ashland, the Lower Appomattox Trail running along the Appomattox River in the, the Petersburg Colonial Heights area, or even the Birthplace of America Trail, which is gonna run from the Jamestown terminus of the uh, Capitol Trail, either to Hampton or across the river all the way out to Virginia Beach. Now, what does this have to do with Amazon? So if you don't remember, Amazon started as a bookseller. And while you can still buy a book on Amazon, that's not what they're known for. And that's what we're looking for with the Capitol Trail. It may have begun as the only off-road trail in the area, but that's probably not what we're gonna be known for going forward. What the Capitol Trail can be known for in the future is to be a connector. Say you wanna go from, from Petersburg out to Hampton, you'll be able to do that. And along with the other trails, you'll need the Capitol Trail. Or you wanna go from Ashland out to the waterfront, also an option, but you'll need to use the Capitol Trail. And what this project is looking to do is to see how we can help the user who wants to traverse multiple trails, whether for physical fitness or just for convenience, to easily get from one trail to the other. And that is the goal. And while the Capitol Trail will probably never be Amazon, we can learn some lessons and make the Capitol Trail a unique and vital part of a trail system in the region that can be second to none. Mobility, the ability to move or be moved freely and easily. Without it, we are unable to fulfill our most basic needs necessary for survival. Everyone, regardless of ability level, deserves equal access to opportunities. No one should be isolated from their community because they live with a disability. According to 2017 American Community Survey five-year estimates, over 120,000 Richmond region residents are living with some sort of disability, with that number growing each year. The disability community is the only minority that anyone can join at any time in their lives. No one is immune to disability and most people will experience it at some point. While disability is often viewed as a personal problem, leaving the individual fully responsible for the difficulties that may arise. In recent years, we have come to realize the important role environmental factors play in furthering and in some cases causing disability. The Disability Inclusive Transportation Plan recognizes the importance of addressing the unique challenges people with physical disabilities in the Richmond region might face while attempting to access public transportation services. In partnership with Plan RBA, the Richmond Regional Planning Commission, my plan aimed to determine first mile, last mile barriers in the built environment. This planning approach recognizes an individual's commute is more than getting on and off the bus. It recognizes their entire trip from origin to destination. I wanted to understand where in the region is there a need for improved conditions, what barriers look like, and how they impact people who have a hard time physically getting around. 
To answer my questions, I first determined where in the Richmond region is there a high concentration of people with disabilities and other transportation disadvantaged groups through demographic data collection and a rank scoring process. Next, I use the results to locate a census tract deemed most in need of examination of first mile, last mile conditions as my study area. Finally, I used my inventory checklist to pinpoint specific barriers such as inaccessible sidewalks, poorly maintained sidewalks, and dangerous intersections, all contributing to the safety and comfortability of people with disabilities while attempting to access public transportation services. The results reinforced the dire need for improvements. I then asked, how can the region address these concerns? Through regional coordination and collaborative efforts, which is inclusive of people with disabilities, local, state, and federal funding is vital to making improvements. While barriers often outweigh resources, I hope my plan brings awareness to the severity of these issues. It is important that all people understand the significant impact inaccessible public transportation has on people with disabilities, the local economy, and the entire region. Disability affects everybody, and it takes all of us to make a change. Thank you. Connectivity, health, and safety. Amongst others, these are the three key elements to consider when planning for anything bicycle and pedestrian related. As many Americans become more health conscious, Walking, jogging, and bicycling have become more of the popular recreational activities. A direct relation to this trend is the development of outdoor facilities to combat the consistent growth. Specifically, the development of multi-purpose trails has increasingly become one of the most popular initiatives across the country. Focusing in on Chesterfield County, Virginia, a need for a continuous bike and pedestrian facility was identified in the then Aston to Petersburg Trail study. The study covered multiple jurisdictions and provided a suggested path into which to construct the trail. A deeper analysis within the county was conducted fleshing out more specific needs. From this analysis came the information supporting the theory of increased outdoor activity. This can be seen in the Chesterfield County Trails Utilization Counts that are provided in my report. In addition to working with the transportation, planning, and Parks and Constructive Services departments within the county. An 11 question survey was distributed to the residents of the county with assistance of interested parties in the area, including Friends of the Lower Appomattox River Trail and the Virginia Capitol Trail. The survey was released to the public to receive feedback on their opinion of the current bicycle and pedestrian network, suggested improvements and information to the, their personal utilization of the current network. In addition, Questions were asked specifically related to the now fall line trail pertaining to how they will access the trail and what amenities they would like to see. The consolidation of all research findings, comments, and data on our specific goals and objectives in which to conclude my report and provided guidance in the development of the fall line trail. The development of the trail further establishes the connectivity of the bikeways and trail network within the Chesterfield County by providing a continuous vertical connection beginning at the north of the county and terminating in the south. While the trail is in development, advertisement through various sources of broadcasting will be encouraged to promote the use of the trail once complete. Upon its completion, the low stress level trail in regards to its design will be marked with a center line and directional arrows to regulate the flow of traffic. S signage and emergency call boxes will also be scattered along the length of the trail, providing a sense of psychological safety for the trail users and the full immerse themselves into the natural elements, taking in all the elements that the nature has to offer. That is my presentation on the Rural Fire Line Trail. I thank you for your time. Have you ever heard this saying before? Enjoy the journey, not just the destination. Well, I'm going to interpret that saying in a literal way and apply it to urban planning. Destinations such as a person's house, workplace, or favorite park are enjoyable because they provide spaces to live, work, and play. 
However, the transportation network, such as the roads, sidewalks, and trails that people journey on to get to these destinations is sometimes unenjoyable. Drivers can get stuck in traffic. Bicyclists might not have bike lanes or pedestrians might not have sidewalks. In order to make the journey more enjoyable for all people in all modes of transportation, a transportation network must incorporate three concepts, mobility, connectivity, and accessibility. Mobility is a person's ability to move, such as if walking or cycling or non-disabled or disabled. Connectivity focuses on the quantity of routes that connect destinations, and accessibility focuses on the quality of those routes so that people feel safe and comfortable. The Tredegar Street Corridor Plan evaluates and enhances these three concepts of Tredegar Street and its surrounding area by the James River in Richmond, Virginia. Tredegar Street's network consists of roads, walking and cycling trails, and pedestrian bridges that connect to parks, a museum, and offices. The network seems well-connected and highly traveled, but does it allow all people in all modes of transportation to travel safely and comfortably? Based on observations and results from a user survey, the answer is no. There are little to no sidewalks, which leads to crowding and people walking on the street. The existing sidewalks are uneven and lack ramps, so pedestrians, especially those with wheelchairs, walkers, or strollers, have difficulty traversing the jarring terrain. And the street lacks crosswalks, bicycle infrastructure, and signage for drivers and non-drivers, which causes congestion and confusion. In order to enhance the network's current conditions, my plan recommends to build evenly paved sidewalks with ramps on both sides of the street to provide a designated and smooth surface for pedestrians, to paint crosswalks and bicycle markings to ensure the safety of pedestrians and cyclists moving among cars, and to remind drivers that the road isn't just for them, and to install signage to clearly direct drivers and non-drivers to destinations along the river. If these recommendations are put into action, all ages and abilities will be able to travel safely and comfortably in any mode of transportation. The implementation of the Tredegar Street Corridor Plan will have people enjoying not just the destination, but the journey as well. When you think of an alley, you might not think about a place that you want to spend a lot of time in. They're usually reserved for trash, utilities, car storage, and other things we deem too unsightly for normal streets. This is a fairly typical alley in the Carver neighborhood of Richmond, Virginia. Here we can spot some things that some might expect to see in an alley, as well as conditions that make it difficult to travel through the space on foot, bike, or even in a car. We had a small amount of rain last night in Richmond, less than a quarter of an inch. Still, significant stormwater runoff has accumulated, and you can easily spot runoff from edges and adjacent properties as scattered dirt and gravel along the entire alley, and old compacted stone pavers that have given way to potholes and other mobility hazards. This plan's vision is to see Richmond's public alleys utilized to their full potential as biodiverse shared streets acting as active transportation corridors, stormwater management systems, and public spaces that promote high quality of life and community health. This is one of 13 green alleys in Richmond. These are primarily constructed using permeable pavers to reduce stormwater runoff and provide a much improved appearance for spaces that often show poor surface conditions. Other benefits include better accessibility, increased comfort, and reduce property damage as a result of flooding. Additionally, some alleys use green infrastructure techniques such as landscaping, gardens, and planters to further capture stormwater for use in improvements that provide aesthetic and public health benefits. This project sets out to create a green alley network plan that would be an expansion on Richmond's green alley program, detailing tools, policy recommendations, examples, and steps to implementation. In a community survey conducted as part of this plan, over 80% of respondents indicated that they use alleys daily, with 86% using them for walking and 48% for biking. This shows that these are already spaces that are heavily used in daily life. Additionally, residents indicated the two largest issues facing alleys are poor surface condition, 
and a high volume of trash, at 89% and 83% respectively. Two-thirds of respondents preferred these style of pavers over su other surface materials, and walking and biking were preferred for primary alley access by over 35-point margins. This plan shows that alleys hold a truly vast untapped potential, as shared streets and extensions of much-needed green into previously gray public spaces. Hi, and thank you for listening in. Today, I'll be talking about a plan for affordable housing in Reston, Virginia. Reston is a homeowners association located in the Hunter Mill District of Fairfax County in Northern Virginia, about 30 to 40 minutes outside of Washington, DC. Reston has a total population of 60,335 individuals earning an average median income of $146,000, higher than that of the state or the nation. Although Reston is a fairly affluent area to live, there are still 6.9% of the population living below the poverty line. Of Reston's total population, 65% have their bachelor's degree or higher, and 93% are working in white collar jobs. Although Reston is fairly educated and well off, there are still a number of households that do experience cost burden due to the high cost of housing in the area. There is a gap between the supply of housing at different dollar amounts available to those residents living in the area and their income capabilities. In order to close this gap and provide affordable housing for more individuals, this plan suggests that Reston follow a three-step plan. The first step is to protect affordable development. Today, Reston's affordable development is under a 40-year time control period. As Reston ages, it is important to preserve its current affordable units. Reston should utilize overlay zoning and tax incentives to incentivize developers to keep the affordable units they have today affordable for future generations. Reston should also work with the public to understand what upkeep or improvements need to happen at current affordable units in order to allow them to continue to meet the needs of the population. The second goal is to improve affordability. Reston does have some unmet needs of those living in affordable units and also searching for affordable units. Reston should create a support system for those looking to move into an affordable unit to make the process seamless. It should also create an individualized program for affordable units in order to make sure that they are actually affordable for those people living in the unit. Finally, Reston should develop 600 additional units at $500 and 100 transitional units for the homeless population looking to transition into housing. They should also provide programs to support those utilizing these programs. Finally, Reston does need to plan for new units for future development. As Reston continues to grow, so will its demand for affordable housing. In order to continue to meet that demand, Reston should create flexible zoning and incentives to allow Reston to purchase previous office spaces with the potential to turn them into affordable units. Reston should also utilize excess land on existing affordable development to create further units and create a non-negotiable policy as well as a land bank trust in order to ensure affordable development in the future. If Reston works to achieve these three goals, it can create a housing market even more representative of its residents and accessible to all. Thank you. During the summer of 2020, amidst the COVID pandemic and its resultant economic crisis and unprecedented levels of housing instability, the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust launched a pilot lease to own program in Richmond's gentrifying Church Hill neighborhood. The official goal of the program is to expand access to affordable home ownership for black households across the Richmond region by addressing barriers that they disproportionately face because of past and ongoing systemic racism. With the pilot underway, it is time to step back and ask, how can we determine whether the program is achieving its racial equity goal? This plan provides a framework for carrying out a racial equity focused evaluation of the lease to own pilot program. I performed stakeholder engaged research to co-produce the evaluation framework and I drew the following main lessons from my participatory methods, which primarily consisted of stakeholder interviews. Clarifying the goals and evaluating the effectiveness of the pilot program are critical to ensuring the long-term success of an expanded program. 
The program's specific racial equity goal must be clearly and consistently defined and communicated by all program stakeholders. Racial equity must be explicit. Racial equity must also be intentionally advanced in multiple ways. The constant guidepost is a focus on shifting control and power in, in processes and outcomes. Finally, priorities and definitions of success differ among stakeholders. Participants are directly impacted by the program and as such, they hold unparalleled expertise. Therefore, their perspectives and experiences must take precedence in an evaluation. The evaluation framework based upon these lessons is intended to serve as a guide for the participatory design and implementation of an evaluation by an MWCLT coordinated team of stakeholders. Prioritizing the meaningful inclusion of program participants, I suggest ways in which they can engage at different points throughout the process. The utility of this framework extends beyond this particular program as it can serve as an important organizational resource for strengthening and institutionalizing MWCLT's commitment and accountability to fostering racially equitable communities. Engaging in genuine and intentional reflection is crucial for ensuring that MWCLT honors and lives up to Maggie Walker's legacy by advancing racial justice for Black communities and households across the Richmond region. Equitable development on the Richmond Highway Corridor in Richmond, Virginia supports the work of Virginia Community Voice to organize with neighbors advocating for the equitable development of Richmond's South Side neighborhoods along the Richmond Highway, what's formerly known as the Jefferson Davis Highway. As redevelopment has increased at a fast pace in the last few years, Virginia Community Voice and neighbors seek to create an equitable plan that reflects the desires, visions, wants, and needs of residents living on Richmond Highway over those of real estate speculation and profit. The equitable development plan and scorecard were shaped using a people-based approach after, after eight months of attending community listening sessions, focus groups, and participatory community counter mapping activities. The findings show that the community wants to be engaged from the beginning of any development process, and they have their own vision for their community that is valuable and deserving of attention. The neighbor's vision is holistic, fo focusing on early and ongoing engagement, affordable housing, food access, equitable employment, environmental maintenance and resilience, and neighborhood safety. The Virginia Community Voice will use the equitable scorecard to equip neighbors with tools to prevent displacement, hold policymakers and developers accountable and retool the power structures at play with community development to better allow the neighbor's vision of their community to lead development decisions. This is a direct challenge to real estate development and planning as we know it. Suggesting that developers and the city should invest in intentional and long-term community engagement before construction even begins. Neighbors have not always had a voice in development efforts and are excluded when it comes to development decisions. Utilizing an asset-based and radical planning approach to develop the Equitable Development Plan and Equitable Development Scorecard, Virginia Community Voice and the neighbors can influence the direction of their own community on Richmond Highway, building from their own self-determination, vision, and agency. Thank you. When you think of your community, what are some of the things that come to mind? A place where you and others feel welcome? A space that embodies a piece of your city's culture? A space you feel comfortable walking through or riding around? A place you can call home? For me, those are a few of the things that come to mind. And I wouldn't be surprised if you thought of the same things. All of those things are positive characteristics of our communities. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines community as a unified body of individuals, such as the people with common interests living in a particular area, 
or a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together within a larger society. However, communities can be adversely impacted by a variety of factors, including a lack of direct access to basic necessities such as food, deteriorating infrastructure, and of course, the threat of gentrification. Those are some of the issues facing the community that surrounds the historic Norfolk Scope Entertainment Complex in downtown Norfolk, Virginia. The Norfolk Scope Entertainment Complex consists of Scope Arena, a concert and sports venue, and Chrysler Hall, a performing arts venue. There are a variety of plans and current challenges that impact the future of the area, including the potential for a new arena to replace the Scope Arena, an expansion of Chrysler Hall, a downtown public housing redevelopment project that could displace longtime residents of the area, loss of the only the area's only grocery store in March of 2020, making it a food desert, as well as flooding concerns and issues with transportation infrastructure. The city has identified two key sites for potential redevelopment. This includes a large parking lot to the east of the Scope Arena, as well as a hotel to the north of the Scope Arena. The methodology used to complete this plan includes the conduction of a SWO analysis, SWO standing for strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities, evaluation of existing and previous plans for the area, and a four-part community survey, which was disseminated online. Key findings throughout my research process include the blighted infrastructure within the community, unsafe walking conditions, as well as riding conditions within the area, a lack of activity outside of events at the scope complex. During the survey, many respondents indicated that the area felt disconnected from the rest of downtown Norfolk. Due to the public housing transformation project, there is a need for affordable housing within the area. And many respondents indicated that they would like to see a grocery store, more open space, and cultural facilities such as museums, all within the community. My recommendations to be found in this project include three redevelopment scenarios involving the two key sites within the area, as well as recommendations for area-wide enhancement. All of my recommendations seek to expand economic growth, encourage tourism, promote inclusion, celebrate culture, and ensure sustainability. Ultimately, regardless of which scenario is implemented in the years to come, it is certain to foster a healthy, vibrant, and thriving environment for all, just like the communities that we have come to know and love. My name is Jane Houck, and I created the Stony Point Fashion Park Small Area Plan. The purpose of the Stony Point Fashion Park Small Area Plan is to explore the value and future of the fashion park through the, through the creation of a small area plan. This topic needs to be addressed immediately because malls are facing a sharp decline in economic growth and usage. Online shopping brings a competition that malls do not seem to be equipped to address. This drives the research question. How can Stony Point Fashion Park be reimagined to attract business, increase residential growth, and maximize the potential for new services? Stony Point Fashion Park is located in the westernmost portion of the city of Richmond. The James River lies to the north, residential areas to its east, and the Chesterfield County border to its south and west. The Lewis G. Laris Park is to the southeast of Stony Point. The major roads within the node are Chippenham Parkway, which runs on the eastern portion of the area, and Stony Point Parkway, which circles the fashion park. There is open space along the northernmost portion of the, of the node along the James River. To the south of the open space is office medical use. To the southeast is additional office medical use. And to the west, southwest is an apartment complex. For the purposes of this small area plan, a new urbanist village style development will be the focal point. 
This approach will best achieve the distinct vision of the mall because it integrates a mixture of uses into one small area and allows a one-stop destination for residents and visitors alike to live, work, and play all within Stony Point. In the lexicon of new urbanism, a transect tool used to describe the characteristics of places and the transition from one place to another, Stony Point Fashion Park currently exists at the suburban or general urban level. Its location within suburban neighborhoods and its 10 mile distance from Richmond's downtown make it detached from the urban center and urban core of the city. To achieve the level of urbanity that is envisioned, the fashion park needs to increase density in order to be classified as an urban center. An online survey was open from January 28th to February 16th, 2021. There were 254 responses collected in that 19 day period. The survey was spread through social media, neighborhood associations, newsletters, and was sent to local economic development reporters. Respondents were fairly young, and very opinionated on the mall's current state and what they would like to see from the space. Many were open to housing and almost all respondents still shop for some goods in a physical storefront, which shows that online shopping has not completely taken over. Many respondents gave great suggestions as to what they would like to see from Stony Point, bike and pedestrian access, a mix of uses, public gathering spaces, and making the most of the space. Findings from the survey provided detailed information on aspects of the fashion park identified by the community. These results were then used to create a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. This also created the four recommendations of the small area plan. The first being to increase connectivity to the fashion park. The community wants ease of access by car, foot, and bicycle. Right now, the fashion park is locked in and inaccessible by means other than vehicles. There is only one way in and out of the fashion park via the Chippenham Parkway. The fashion park's prime location between the Chippenham Parkway and Stony Point Road, surrounded by offices, a public park and residences, creates a prime location for a mixed use village style development. Create green spaces. Newly created green spaces within the fashion park would benefit those living in the new residences within the fashion park and would also be accessible to existing residential areas. Approximately 72 acres of vacant or underdeveloped land exists in Stony Point, or 27% of the total land area. These acres primarily consist of developed and underused parking lots that surround the mall. Green spaces surrounding the fashion park would assist in placemaking and expand the appeal to and from the Lewis G. Lairs Park. Incorporate upper level housing into the fashion park. There are currently two residential complexes within the fashion park area. There's great opportunity for the fashion park to grow vertically. And with the addition of increased access and green space, the fashion park will be an exciting place to live. Establish a sense of place at the fashion park. Stony Point Fashion Park is surrounded by medical offices, residences, and a park. This community needs a center point or hub that connects all its features, serves various needs, and keeps people coming back, creating a central hub that caters to daily needs and allows for both formal and informal gatherings will strengthen the fashion park area and the various surrounding uses. The Stony Point Fashion Park Small Area Plan explores revitalization opportunities that will keep the mall from facing the same fate as many other malls in America, complete closure and abandonment. The fashion park's ideal geographic location with access to a major roadway and encompassing residences, offices, and a 100 acre park creates the unique opportunity of becoming a self-sustaining community center with shopping, services, residences, and green spaces. A successful revitalization requires Richmond to be actively engaged in the repositioning of the mall. This would include sponsoring a design charrette, 
creating public forums for continual community input and canvassing in the form of personal interactions at the recommended placemaking events at the fashion park to gain better insight into the desires of the community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Logan Ashby, and today I want to talk to you about my professional plan, wayfinding and warrant. So first, what exactly is wayfinding? In simplest terms, wayfinding is a collection of visual clues to help people navigate their built environment more easily. Typically, wayfinding signage is classified into four different types. There's directional signage, which clarifies to people which route will be optimal to reach their destination. Informational signage which provides context for a given area, such as the location of bus stops, or the specific history for a site. Third, there's identification signage, which clarifies to people that they have reached their destination. And lastly, there's regulatory signage, which provides information such as speed limits, stop signs, and road names, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. So about my plan. So I did this project for Warrenton, Virginia, which is located 45 miles outside of Washington, DC. Warrenton provides numerous dining, shopping, and recreational opportunities to residents and visitors alike. So my client, the Department of Community Development, wanted research to help them provide recommendations to assist the development of a wayfinding system to improve tourism, increase safety, and establish a strong sense of place throughout the town. My approach to it for this was to perform an audit on the existing wayfinding system to see how it can be improved and where wayfinding signage is currently needed. Doing this, I came up with three main recommendations for Oregon. First, they need to collaborate the wayfinding system in collaboration with residents and stakeholders. The residents should have a say in how the wayfinding system looks like and stakeholders such as business associations can help clarify what exactly gets signage. Second, warranting to establish since of arrival into Warrington and then guide visitors to the town's districts and amenities. This can be accomplished by updating the town's gateways to encourage that it all has a cohesive design and theme and makes a bold statement that people have arrived in Warrington. Once they've arrived, key intersections highlighted in pink on this map should have signage in place to guide people to the different districts and amenities that Warrenton has to offer. Third, Warrenton should enhance connections and modify the existing wayfinding system throughout the town. This can be accomplished by ensuring future developments to additional parks or bikeways are also included in the wayfinding system and that existing signage that is in place is also updated to reflect the town's branding. If Warrington accomplishes these three goals, it can become an easy place to navigate that supports active transportation and has a strong sense of place. Thank you very much for being a good day. Petersburg, Virginia is a city that has weathered population and industrial decline, which has resulted in an abundance of city owned vacant property. Recently, the Richmond metropolitan area has experienced rapid population growth and is projected to grow nearly 21% between 2010 and 2030. Petersburg, on the other hand, is projected to continue losing population during that same time period. However, the city is well positioned to capitalize on the growth momentum occurring throughout the rest of the region. Aggressive revitalization anchored by a strong land development strategy is crucial for Petersburg to benefit from regional growth trends. This potential begins with the disposition, meaning the transfer of property, and development of over 250 city-owned vacant properties throughout Petersburg. The presence of vacant land can negatively impact neighborhood vitality, lower property values, and burden localities by decreasing tax revenues. The purpose of this plan is to provide recommendations to streamline Petersburg's disposition process and complement the city's existing policies while also providing recommendations to attract development through short-term and long-term strategies. To inform Petersburg's approach, this plan considered precedent plans from five mature cities throughout the East Coast and Midwestern United States. The goal of this research was to find out how other cities are combating their vacant property and how good practices can be incorporated into Petersburg. Through an iterative planning process, I turned to representatives from the study cities, developers familiar with Petersburg, and regional community development professionals for their feedback. The recommendations presented in this plan are intended to guide the city of Petersburg and capture some of the development interests that the rest of the region is experiencing. The recommendations focus on three main goals, creating a targeted approach to disposition and development by focusing on certain areas of the city first and then shifting as development becomes self-sustaining, appropriately scaled strategies for individual purchasers and larger scale developers, 
and implementing specific tools for both disposition and development, such as a robust side lot program, aggressive code, code enforcement, and a community engagement component. The research findings and conversations with those familiar with revitalization and Petersburg strengthen the idea that a proactive approach is necessary for Petersburg to capitalize on regional growth trends to increase revenue and economic stability and ultimately revitalize the city. On behalf of the Master of Urban and Regional Planning Program, we'd like to thank all the clients that worked with our students this year. And we'd like to offer a hearty congratulations to all of our graduates Congratulations, MERP class of 2021.